Hello my friends. Today we will be discussing calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease, also known as CPPD or pseudogout. Good prerequisites for this discussion will be to review the talk on gout, to review the introductory talk, and if you get a chance you might even want to look at the talk on rheumatoid arthritis. I hope this is useful to you. Thank you. Let's proceed with our discussion of calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease. Basically, calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease is a, a type of arthritis that is caused by calcium pyrophosphate crystals depositing in the cartilage. We really don't know why people have it, but there are risk factors. It can occur more as people age. There seems to be an association with osteoarthritis, and we'll talk about this in a bit. There are some metabolic risk factors, hypophosphatasia, hyperparathyroidism, as you can imagine, because it can cause high calcium, hemochromatosis, hypomagnesia, gout. However, the majority of patients that have this, there is no associated metabolic abnormality found. Finally, there are familial groups that have calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease, but again, this does not happen very often. The pathologic anatomy, basically, especially with pseudogout, the patients will have a highly inflamed synovial fusion, and when the fluid is looked at with a polarized light microscope, calcium pyrophosphate crystals can be seen. These are rhomboid and weakly birefringent crystals, as seen here. They're sort of blue when they're parallel to the, the plane of the polarizer, and they're yellow when perpendicular, which is different than gout crystals. And here's actually a comparison of calcium pyrophosphate deposition crystals compared to gout. See how the gout's more needle-like? See how that it's actually yellow when it's perpendicular to the CPPD crystal? One can actually see cartilage calcium along the cartilage if one has any pathologic anatomy like with a joint replacement and the calcium can also be seen on x-ray deposited along the, cal uh, the cartilage. Now the question is how, why does this occur? Typically normally chondrocytes do make a lot of calcium pyrophosphate and that's associated with production of extracellular uh, ATP. Now why it leads to disease in some people and not others, I don't know. But anyway, these crystals then can mediate disease several ways. Number one, they can initiate inflammation. This is the classic calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease we see with pseudogout. They can sometimes have direct catabolic effects on the chondrocytes, which can cause cartilage damage, or they can alter the mechanical properties of the cartilage which can also cause cartilage damage. The presentation can vary. The classic presentation we think of as pseudogout where there's vigorous inflammation in the joint and this inflammation is so aggressive that it can look like gout or septic arthritis. Typically the distribution is more common in the knee and the wrist but not the first metacarpal, uh, metatarsal phalangeal joint such as one sees in gout. They can have constitutional symptoms of fever associated, and the, the flares can last from weeks to months, which again is different than gout, which only lasts several days to weeks. Another presentation is chronic CPPD crystal arthritis. They can have a polyarticular osteoarthritis, but the distribution is different than in normal osteoarthritis. There can be joint or there can be shoulder or glenohumeral joint involvement. They can have wrist involvement and metacarpal, metacarpal phalangeal joint involvement. This sort of leads to the next presentation, which is a rheumatoid arthritis-like presentation. One can imagine if they have metacarpal phalangeal and wrist involvement and there's associated inflammation, such as occurs in a pseudogout, this could look just like rheumatoid. Another curious presentation is that of spinal involvement, and I'll state this does not occur very often. They can have involvement in the intervertebral disc and spinal ligaments, and, and on x-ray they can have something called a crown dens. Basically what one sees with this is calcification along the dens of the axial 
vertebrae. Uh, it's not seen so well in the x-ray here, the open mouth x-rays of the neck, but it can be seen here on the CT scan. And you'll see the little bit of the calcium up there. You can imagine if this presents with very severe neck pain and inflammation of the neck and high inflammatory markers with neck stiffness and fevers, it could look very much like meningitis. Sometimes the patients will get severe, such severe damage in the joint that they can look like Charcot joints. And then lastly is asymptomatic chondrocalcinosis. This can be sometimes found as a clinical finding on x-ray done for other reasons. The prevalence of this is really not known, nor is the significance. We don't know if this will necessarily lead to a CPPD type of disease. Now, historically, typically what we think about again is pseudogout, where there's a sudden inflammatory arthritis, typically in the near wrist, but other joints can be involved. Again, it can look like gout or pseudogout. They can also uh, have a chronic polyarticular CPPD, which looks like rheumatoid, we talked about if they have wrist and metacarpal phalangeal joint involvement. Osteoarthritis, when it occurs in unusual locations, such as the shoulders, wrist, or metacarpal phalangeal joints, one needs to think about CPPD. And again, we talked about how this would be in the differential of meningitis. Currently, there is not proposed diagnostic criteria by governing bodies such as the American College of Rheumatology. However, one criteria that is very useful and important is the visualization of crystals on polarized light microscopy. We talked about this, how the calcium pyrophosphate crystals are weakly positively birefringent and rhomboid. And what I mean by that is they're blue in the plane of the polarizer, yellow when perpendicular. X-ray can also be helpful. One can see the calcium in the joint on this knee. One can see it in the triangular cartilage of the wrist here. In this x-ray, one's actually seen osteoarthritis in an unusual location, the metacarpal phalangeal joints with osteophytes. This is an ultrasound of a joint, and one can see the cartilage, the calcium deposited in the cartilage. Again, x-ray of the joint, one can see calcium deposited under the acromion along the humeral head. This is also osteoarthritis in an unusual location, Note in this x-ray that there's significant narrowing of the glenohumeral joint. See how narrow this is here, and you can see a little spur down here. These are the diagnostic criteria of Ryan and McCarthy. And again, there is not a classification criteria published by the American College of Rheumatology. Basically, they would make the diagnosis based on the proof of calcium pyrophosphate deposition crystals obtained by either biopsy, necropsy, or aspiration by using a chemical means such as x-ray diffraction or chemical analysis. So if they prove chemically for sure they're calcium pyrophosphate deposition crystals, then they would say that's definite criteria. In lieu of that, they state that if crystals are seen on polarized light microscopy that are consistent with calcium pyrophosphate crystals, and if there's evidence of calcification on x-ray, if they have both those criteria, then they would call that definite criteria for CPPD. If they have just one of these two criteria, such as the crystals or the x-ray changes, but not both, then they would call that probable CPPD. And then they list a lot of other things that cause them to think, gee, maybe that's possible, such as x-rays, showing osteoarthritis in unusual locations and things such as that. Studies that are done in the workup and evaluation of CPPD is mention of key importance is aspiration of the joint and observation of synovial fluid for CPPD crystals under polarized or CPP crystals under polarized light microscopy. Secondly is x-ray, looking for evidence of the chondrocalcinosis. Remember that CPPD can be associated with or can be a presenting sign for hyperparathyroidism, hypophosphatasia, hemochromatosis, or hypomagnesia. So it makes sense to look for these electrolyte abnormalities in evaluating the patients. Admittedly, 
the probability of these are pretty low or they, they don't occur very often, but one needs to think about it and look. Now with respect to treatment, it's actually very similar to gout in that we suppress the acute flare with either the intraarticular corticosteroids or colchicine or a non-steroidal or uh, systemic prednisone. And it cools down generally fairly easily, although not as easy as gout. And then control of chronic inflammation associated with uh, the pseudogout and the rheumatoid arthritis type of, of CPPD is generally done with chronic suppression with either colchicine, and again, I like colchicine for this very much, but as per my discussion in gout, a lot of times I had trouble explaining that to insurance companies. non can be used. Sometimes one, if one cannot use non or colchicine, prednisone can be used. And in their paper, Rosenthal and Ryan suggest a trial of things such as hydroxychloroquine, methotrexate, or IL-1 beta inhibitors. Again, these are medicines we use to treat rheumatoid arthritis. In my practice, I did not do that. I generally had pretty good control with the colchicine or the non as as I note. Occasionally, I found that I could treat for a while and withdraw, and they wouldn't continue to have flares of the inflammatory pseudogout or rheumatoid-like picture. With respect to the osteoarthritis and unusual joints, really there's not a whole lot to do for those other than treat them like with osteoarthritis, strengthening physical therapy, non in when they get to the appropriate time, joint replacement. Thank you for listening to my discussion on calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease today. Next we'll be discussing septic arthritis.